Welcome to the Garden of Death. Humans are weird creatures. We're obsessed with life. We're obsessed with trying to extend our lives. We're trying to eat, drink green sludge and go to the gym and put chia seeds down our pants and cover ourselves in rare honey and all those things to make our lives longer. But we're also obsessed with death. And that crow going basically means that that crow is also obsessed with death and crows are associated with death. Death fascinates us. Video games, books, you know, movies, uh, songs. We just can't get enough of death because we, what happens when you die? What does it feel like? Where do you go? How much do coffins cost? Um, what songs shall I have at my funeral? We are obsessed with death. So today I've come to Kelly's house, which is um, a poison garden uh, down in Devon. And there's enough death in this garden to wipe out everybody in Devon. It is full of really dangerous, really exciting, really fantastic plants. I can't wait to get involved and show you some of these monsters because they are also wonderful and beautiful and misunderstood. All you need to do is learn about them and learn how not to get wiped out by them and then just respect them. So without any further ado, welcome to the Garden of Death. So it's springtime, let's start with everybody's favourite springtime flower, bluebells. Now, what's wrong with this picture? Well, these are Spanish bluebells, they're not British bluebells. And some people go, oh, nasty Spanish bluebells. But actually, they're very, very beautiful. And they've been in this country since the 17th century, so it's about time we just kind of got over that. But beautiful, you know, nothing better than a bluebell would in the spring. But are they dangerous? Are they death or are they dinner? I don't know about death, but you do not want to eat these. Nausea, vomiting, stuck in summer upsets, all, all the usual kind of suspects of something really nasty. They contain toxic glycosides, which basically will make you feel absolutely crap. One of the funniest things I read about them is this, somebody said, oh, well, you can easily mistake, you know, the bulb of a bluebell for like, you know, a spring onion or something, and, and that would be a bad mistake to make. Um, if you mistake the bulb of one of these for a spring onion, you're a bloody idiot, because <laughs> just smell it. It doesn't smell like onion. Um, it doesn't really look like a spring onion either, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but yeah, you don't want to eat them. Um, also, you don't want to start picking them either. You can actually get in a lot of trouble because bluebells are protected. Um, they're protected because we love them. They're protected because, you know, they are actually the most popular flower in the UK. Also, bluebell woods, because they spread all out across the floor, the leaves are really susceptible to being squashed by being shodden on, which basically destroys them. So you have to be careful around them. You're not supposed to pick them. This is private land, so technically you could, but whatever you do, don't uproot them. If you're caught going out and uprooting bluebells, you can get up to a £5,000 fine and even go to prison. Even go to prison for bluebells. Imagine being in prison. You know, you're in prison, and you've got one of those trays, and you're sloppy on the mashed potato and worried about getting, you know... <laughs> <laughs> jumped in the showers. You're like, what are you in for? It's like, bluebells, yeah, me too, you know. Because uh, you just, you can't do it. There was actually a recent case where a bunch of people just cut down a whole load of them and they got in a lot of trouble. So enjoy the bluebells this time of year. Wonderful thing, walking through a bluebell wood. One of the most fabulous things you can do, but please don't touch them, don't cut them down. For goodness sake, don't eat them. <sighs> you see, look at you. You're just all innocent, all pretty, but deep down you get nasty poison with long teeth and that. Anyway, let's see what else we can find. Oh, this is exciting. I've been waiting a long time for this. This, what do we think? Unassuming looking thing, pretty little flowers, pretty little fondy type leaves. That can't be death, surely. Well, you'd be wrong. This is death, death, death. Pushing up the daisies, pennies on your eyes. Make sure you've got those final expenses sorted out. You know, choose the music for your funeral. This is death. This is Wolfsbane or Monk's Hood. Um, it is listed as arguably the most dangerous plant in the country with hemlock um, or, and yew possibly. Uh, it's quite easy to recognise, thankfully. I mean, you don't generally find this in the wild. It tends to be more in people's gardens, although it could get into the wild, obviously, because the plants do these things. Um, these purple flowers, um, they get quite big and uh, sort of bluish colour. Um, when they mature. The leaves are quite easy to recognise, they're sort of fronds, they look like, um, a bit like antlers I always think. Um, but this is incredibly dangerous, it contains a substance called aconite um, and basically the list of symptoms, dizziness, numbness, heart problems, um, you know, nausea etc etc and it just, I mean, there's no cure for it. So if you eat a load of this stuff you're doomed, you're finished, you're, it's game over. Um, you can even get it from getting it on your skin, it can do you harm. So it's really, a, 
do want to touch it. And what's quite strange is you can buy this stuff from a garden centre and it doesn't come with a warning, which I think is a little bit remiss. I'm not saying don't have it in your garden. If you, as long as you know what it is and you respect it, that's absolutely fine, but it is incredibly dangerous. Um, why is it called wolfsbane? Well, <coughs> it's either that it scares away werewolves or it can make you turn into like shapeshift, like into a werewolf or something like that. Um, of course, neither being true because werewolves are made up. But, you know, if you think you've got a werewolf on your property, it might, might help you. I think maybe a big gun or just moving somewhere else. Um, we'll phone the werewolf police if there are. Are there werewolf police? Um, it's quite famous in history. Um, it was There was someone called Medea who tried to... Um, fool King Aegeus into killing his son Theseus with this stuff and apparently Medea's mother is the person who actually discovered this poison. Um, also um, famously um, Claudius, the, the, uh, the Roman Emperor Claudius, his wife Agrippina poisoned him with aconite. So it's pretty nasty stuff. Um, it's not actually, um, I say, that common in the wild, pretty rare in the wild, but you will see it in gardens. It's very pretty, it's a wonderful thing. Um, but really avoid, don't touch it, don't eat it, don't give it to your friends, don't give it to your dogs, don't put it in a cake. Oh look, that looked pretty on a cake. People do that stuff, you know. I saw a cake the other day we were looking online, it had, had laburnum on it. What is wrong with you? Anyway, <laughs> why are you like this? Still, Wolfsbane Monkshood, very cool, very dangerous. You bugger. It's a yew tree. Looks fairly innocent, doesn't it? Just like a nice sort of piney type thing. Um, of course, yew trees, very famous. One of the most lethal things yew trees were used for um, was for making longbows, which of course, at the Battle of Cressy, various battles in Scotland, um, Battle of Agincourt, was the kind of the nuclear weapon of the uh, medieval era. You know, Edward III and Henry V relied upon it to wipe out their enemies. Um, the, whether the yew was actually made from English yew, Welsh yew, Spanish yew, uh, lots of people have different thoughts on that, but either way, these trees were made, used to make these incredibly powerful bows. Yew trees and the wood is extremely, extremely poisonous. It contains a substance called taxine. This stuff will end you. Um, <clears throat> now, you mustn't eat the leaves, you mustn't eat the well, not that you'd eat the wood. Who eats wood? People, maybe people eat wood, the bark. You don't really want to get it on your skin and your mouth at all. Now, controversially, there are berries on the yew tree later in the year, and they are edible. They're not, they don't particularly taste very nice, but they are edible. And I got in an argument with someone about this, because my view of this is just don't bother with them. Because whilst the fruit's edible, the seed is one of the most poisonous parts of the of the entire plant and it will kill you. You eat that seed, a couple of those seeds, you bite into it by accident and swallow it. You, you, I mean, it's really, really dead, and particularly for children. I mean, it'll wipe them out. So my view on that is just don't bother with it. Okay, there are much better fruits out there to eat. Um, I have to say it's edible because, but, but taxing, yeah, very dangerous. But so you treat, quite easy to recognize. Um, I mean, it, it looks like any other kind of like sort of conifer sort of pine, but um, all of these, you see all the shoots sort of coming out from the side, they're very sort of bushy kinds of trees. And when they get older, they're very old and gnarly. Some of the oldest trees, there's a yew tree in Scotland, which is supposed to be about 5,000 years old or something crazy like that. Um, very easy to recognize the bark, it's sort of flaky reddish bark. Um, a good one to know, you know, and, and just really one to uh, admire. They're wonderful trees. They live a long time. They're kind of wise old man of the forest thing. And I'm really, really fond of yew trees. Um, but just leave them be, enjoy them, and just don't touch them. Don't get this stuff in your mouth or in your hands and stuff because it can be quite nasty. Um, but a wonderful, um, a wonderful tree for stories, you know. It's great that it's got this, you know, the idea of them making the bows out of there and, you know, all these sort of the, the, the Hundred Years' War, which was <laughs> just like most wars. Utterly pointless, but you know, there it is, it happened, and actually it turns out that uh, I think we actually end up losing the Hundred Year War, um, thanks to various um, stupidity. We shouldn't have started it in the first place. Anyway, there we are. This plant has a ridiculous name. This plant is called Dog's Mercury, which is an unusual name because it's not a dog, it's not a planet, and it certainly isn't a metal which is liquid at room temperature. And is it death or is it dinner? Well, it's actually a really nasty little plant. It looks like an unimposing little thing, um, but you know, it's gonna give you diarrhea and nausea and depression and you break up with your girlfriend and you have nightmares and you, 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 you're hallucinating and you think that you wake up and you think that your, your nipples are self-destruct buttons and you're afraid to touch them and it's just a small, little, unimposing little plant. Oh, it's a, but it wants to kill you. 
I mean, actually, you know, it, it is really quite nasty, and it's called dog's mercury because the, the symptoms are quite similar to mercury poisoning. Obviously, not good for dogs, not good for anybody, really. The only thing that is good for us, apparently, is something called a speckled cricket, which I think is the larvae of that particular creature. It seems to like this stuff. Must be a tough little bugger, mustn't it? Be able to survive all that stuff. Or maybe it just puts it to one side and just does a little bit of meditation. I'm not sure crickets can do that. I don't think they can cross their legs. Um, but yeah, it's a wonderful little thing. It's, it, I mean, you know, it, it's pretty. It's quite easy to recognise. There is one thing you could possibly confuse it with. It's something called Good King Henry, which is the same family. It's called Good King Henry because you can eat it. Uh, this is actually sometimes called Bad King Henry for the same reasons. And if we're talking about Henry VIII, in fact, most of the Henrys were pretty bad. I think Henry V was all right. The others, yeah, not so much. Um, particularly Henry VIII, very bad. Um, Henry IV, very bad. Anyway, the Henrys weren't good, but to why it's called Good King Henry, who knows? The way to recognise it is it's got these tiny little seeds on these sort of stems at the top, um, and they're like sort of little pyramid shapes. So if you look, so look at it really, really closely, you can see them, and it's quite easy to just check those seeds out, and then you're there. Um, the only other thing that it's useful for is that it's an indicator of a very ancient woodland. So um, if you find this stuff, you're in a place which has been a, you know wooden for a very long time, and you know it's quite that's kind of cool, I suppose. Now, this rather unassuming thing, these are called lesser celandine, but it has other names too. It's often called figwort or pilewort, and we'll go into that in a minute. So, is it poisonous? Well, yes, it is. And particularly once it's flowered. It's supposed to be a bit less poisonous before it's flowered. Who knows why? Don't eat any part of the plant. It contains something called pyridazine or py pyrazine alkaloids, which I'm not even going to pretend to know how to pronounce. But yeah, basically, like a lot of alkaloids, not good for you, upset stomach, nausea, the usual kind of suspects. There are also quite funny facts about this though. First of all, it's called pilewort and figwort, because a fig um, is an old fashioned word for, <laughs> for hemorrhoids, bum lumps basically. Um, and apparently it was used in the treatment of hemorrhoids, uh, which, is, which is charming. So hence figwort, hence um, piles, he piles as well, so pilewort. Um, another rather random fact about this was I. <laughs> <laughs> which I don't really understand, is that apparently in Cumberland, and Cumberland only as far as I know, part of this plant was used for brushing your teeth. I'm not sure how or why. Um, if anyone from Cumberland does know um, how that works, then do let, just do let me know, because um, it sounds a bit random to me. I also heard that if you were to pick it before the flowers, um, it could be used for treating scurvy, which presumably means it's got quite a lot of vitamin C in it. Um, but again, there's much better things um, for, for scurvy, um, scurvy grass, for example, or uh, rose hips that have got a lot of vitamin C in them, rather than this, which obviously has a sort of toxicity to it. I've also read that you can use the root as a starchy winter vegetable if you boil it X amount of times. It's often the case with a lot of things, if you give them enough cooking, you can eat them, but you know, by the time you boil it that many times, it's going to be a bit tasteless, isn't it? So there's other things to eat which are better. But um, so this is the lesser celandine, and there's also a, a greater celandine which is also in this garden. We're going to have a look at that again in a, in a minute as well. But yeah, it's quite an interesting plant. It's everywhere this time of year. It's quite easy to recognise as well as the yellow flowers, the leaves, these sort of spade-shaped leaves, and they've got these sort of lighter patches on them, um, and that makes it quite easy to recognise. It carpets the floor. I mean, I mean, even in London, where, where I've been living, it's absolutely everywhere. This stuff. Um, and it's pretty. I mean, if you get it across your lawn, it's very nice. It's the same family as buttercups. Um, but uh, yeah, best, best to look at and, and not to eat, in my opinion. 